Welcome to the CoinGecko podcast for today's episode. We have the honor of welcoming Sam Kazimian, founder at Frax Finance. Uh, before starting Frax, uh, Sam was a co-founder and president at, of Everypedia, the first decentralized online encyclopedia on the blockchain. Sam graduated from UCLA in 2015, double majoring in neuroscience and philosophy. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Frax. Uh, I, have, um, I have some position in Frax and disclosure. Uh, I wrote a tweet on Frax and I'm super happy to have Frax uh, I'm super happy to have Sam join us on the CoinGecko podcast today to talk and learn more about Frex today. So welcome to the CoinGecko podcast, Sam. Thanks, Bobby. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we're just, uh, Jason, head of engineering, we're just here uh, cranking away nonstop. Uh, um, you know, we've been building since launching three weeks ago and things are good. So really appreciate being here. Yeah, I guess, I guess for the first question, right, Sam, maybe let's start with a basic introduction of Frax. So tell, tell us the listeners who are not familiar with Frax, what is Frax um, and, and, and how is it special? Yeah, so, so we like to uh, say that um, we get our name, Frax, from the stability mechanism that we invented. So fractional algorithmic uh, currency in terms of a, of a stable coin. So what that actually means is um, Frax is the first time where uh, we've introduced the idea of a market set collateral ratio. So a stable coin that is only uh, partially backed, but how much it's partially backed is, is set by the market uh, at whatever rate that the stable coin is going to uh, keep its target price. So for Frax, it's $1, right? And um, the idea with this fractional algorithmic mechanism is that it starts off 100% collateralized. And so we started the protocol with just USDC as collateral. Super simple, it, USDC is a dollar, it, it is a uh, you know, centralized stable coin, but you can take this idea to with volatile collateral later. In fact, we might, but right now we only uh, use USDC. The protocol starts 100% collateralized. As it expands, it'll slowly test uh, lower and lower collateral ratios. And so what that means is uh, the FRAX stablecoin is only backed uh, by USDC at the collateral ratio. So for example, you know, 95%, uh, percent, that means that it's only backed by 0.95 USDC and five cents of value is uh, stabilized algorithmically, right? With uh, no backing. And um, it'll change the collateral ratio. And if the price drops below a dollar, it'll increase the collateral ratio. And so that, that's kind of the unique coherent idea that we not only named Frax after fractional algorithmic uh, currency, but we kind of introduced this uh, you know, novel stability mechanism for the first time that I think uh, a lot of people in DeFi are, are talking about. Cool, man. I mean, Frax is the first fractional algorithmic stable coin uh, being created. Uh, this must be pretty awesome, right? I mean, inventing something that on, on mainnet uh, in live in production that nobody has done this before, right? Yeah, that, that's what's really exciting. It's also uh, a little bit uh, nerve wracking, right? Because because we don't know how it'll work. Um, so far, uh, it's worked great. You know, the the uh, entire protocol is around eighty four uh, percent collateralized right now, and there's over a hundred million uh, frax stable coins in circulation. So that means there's about sixteen million uh, fracs that are algorithmically stabilized. And um, it's been keeping the peg uh, quite tight, you know, give or take uh, one cent. Um, you can, you know, you can see the graph on CoinGecko. We actually uh, use uh, your guys' great and, and really reliable prices on our front end as well. Um, so appreciate that. And um, it's, been, it's been doing fine. But the, the thing about it is it's, we don't know, right? And so that's what makes it really experimental, really interesting. And um, we'll see, but I think that it's going to turn out to be one of the uh, better ways of stabilizing a, a currency or these algorithmic stable coins. Yeah, I mean, if we look at the price of Frax, so, so for Frax, for those of you who are not uh, already aware of it, so Frax, there's two tokens in the Frax ecosystem. The first one is Frax, which is uh, a stable coin pegged to the US dollar. So if you look at a historical chart, like Frax has pretty much maintained its peg around between 96 cents to $1, two cents or so uh, during times of extreme volatility. This, although it's not exactly $1, it's been pretty good compared to all the other algorithmic stable coins, which hold anywhere between 30 cents to $2.50, which is quite crazy considering that it's, it aims to be a stable coin. 
The other token in Frax is really um, the share, Frax share token, FXS. So um, maybe, maybe let's, let's go in a little bit deeper into this Frax share token and then uh, what's the use of FXS and uh, how, that, how, how does it come into creation or goes out of, of circulation? Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit. Yeah, so basically in Frax, there's obviously a portion of the Frax stablecoin supply that's um, stabilized algorithmically, right? And so what algorithmic stablecoins generally have in common is there's either a bond or share or sometimes both uh, token mechanism that basically uh, expands or retracts, you know, when it's expanding, uh, signage value is given to the, the shares. And then when it retracts, um, basically, it's uh, the stable coins bought back to retract the supply. The frac share token is what's used to enact that monetary policy for the algorithmic uh, portion of the, the frac supply. And the frac share token gets uh, all signage value um, fees from the protocol in terms of revenue of like minting, redeeming fees and things like that. And then all excess collateral value, which is collateral in the system uh, that was originally put in at higher collateral ratios and that now that Frax is uh, more um, algorithmic is no longer needed in the system. So Frax shareholders actually get uh, that value back in, into the Frax share distribution. So in, uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting uh, use case for a fraction. How, how do you guys come up with this fraction algorithmic idea? Was it you guys or someone else wrote about it and then you guys are the first team to actually implement, execute this idea? I mean, well, first of all, I always like to, you know, uh, give credit to people who Im incremented the field, right? So obviously Frax, uh, the mechanism is unique, right? The, the thing that we've come up with that's, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, you know, all of uh, the co-founders and stuff had a huge hand in is, is this novel market set collateral ratio that, that adjusts based on the, the price of the stable coin. Obviously, uh, things that, you know, have inspired me are the original Robert, Sam, Signer, Chairs, White Paper, um, a lot of the, the basis uh, guys in the original uh, basis uh, White Paper, um, you know, Nodder and, and those guys. And, um, yeah, it's like a, it's an amalgamation of a lot of stuff, and it's uh, it's in crypto everything is iterative, right? And and one of the main stories that I like to tell about how uh, Frax came to be is uh, the whole Tether saga when you know they they were um, in a legal dispute with the New York Attorney General. Uh, it was like about two years ago, and there was a uh, you know there was a public claim by by the. Um, New York Attorney General that Tether is only 74 cents backed by, you know, actual deposits, right? And then the, the rest of it is like not dollars, whatever it is, they, they stabilize it in whatever way and, and stuff like that. Uh, what was really interesting about that is nothing happened to the Tether price where, you know, when, when that was actually announced publicly, right, because it was a public lawsuit and stuff, uh, I, I was looking at it, I was like, holy crap, like Tether's going to go to 90 cents or 80 or whatever, um, but it didn't budge, right? And so that was the first, uh, you know, thing that I thought of. I was like, well, what does that mean? That basically means that because Tether is so tightly integrated into the crypto community, all of these trading pairs, everyone relies on it. It has extremely high liquidity as uh, money, as, as cash, and kind of that whole thing of uh, you kind of will it into existence. And everyone believes uh, this is a dollar, right? And it kind of has this uh, force of monetary premium. Like people actually create value in the sense that this is used as cash. What that meant about Tether is there was at least 26 cents, give or take, of, of monetary premium of, of this value in there that obviously was not uh, needed to come from the collateral, the dollar deposits, right? And so in that situation, I was thinking like, uh, how do you create a decentralized, transparent and, and trustless protocol that actually measures monetary premium? Like how would you create something that uh, starts off fully backed, uh, you know, like people said about Tether and then uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, you can actually test the market's belief. I do think Tether is now fully backed. I'm actually not one of the, uh, you know, Tether truthers and, and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if, if they, you know, didn't take care of all of that stuff, uh, they would not be operating. So I, I do think now they're, they're fully compliant, but the idea behind this is that how can we create a, you know, 
completely transparent protocol that, that actually measures the amount of uh, you know, monetary premium of a, of a stable coin. And so that's, that's what led us to trying to just redefine the categorization of, uh, of stable coins. So uh, as you probably know, before we released Frax, there was uh, those, those stable coin triangles and, and types where, you know, there's like fiat backed up here and then there's like over collateralized crypto here. And then there was fully algorithmic, right? Like signer shares, basis and, and stuff like that, right? And everyone would always talk about stuff like that. And so we actually just wanted to redefine the whole paradigm, right? We actually wanted to say, why would you go from, you know, 100% or over to zero, right? Like why, why is that the, the dichotomy, right? Why is it 100 zero, right? Why isn't there something in, in the middle? Uh, and, and then once we started asking that question, we started saying, okay, uh, what is the middle? Is it 50? Is it 60? Is it 70? What's the thing? And, and, and we came to the idea, why don't you let the market decide instead of like trying to have to convince people, oh, well, we're going to vote on governance and see if it like, you know, depegs or repegs or whatever. Uh, why don't we just create a really good mechanism, right? We create good game theory that actually just tests the market's belief of what that collateral ratio should be. I think, I think it's a very interesting story on how you saw that Tether or Tether wasn't back, uh, fully back to a dollar. Um, I thought there was a big issue in the crypto as well. Uh, I, I've been telling a lot of people myself that Tether's kind of the single biggest race in crypto. Uh, we don't know if it's fully back, but if it falls for whatever reason, I hope it doesn't fall, but if it does fall, then everything's going to go. It's going to be a bad day for crypto. Uh, thankfully, I think, I mean, Paolo from Bitfinex says that they're all fully compliant and registered in the US these days, and I think they have bank accounts these days, but uh, there's still this aura, there's this hello effect where there's so, so much negative news from Tether, but, and I mean, don't know, I hope, I, hope, I hope it stays well. I was very worried holding Tether for a long time, uh, but now, I guess everybody seems to agree that Tether is $1, sort of like kind of fiat money kind of system, like even if it goes down like 75%, people still believe it's worth a dollar. Um, but, and, and it's interesting how you kind of think that, I mean, the market seems to have like extreme, right? So, I mean, I was doing a slide for CoinGecko's annual report a few days ago and where we categorized the various stable coins between uh, fully fiat collateral like USDC, USDT to like over collateralized stable coins like DAI, SUSD, and then to the extreme algorithmic stable coins like Ampo and Basis, uh, you know? So um, why isn't there something in the middle and, and Frax falls right in the middle of that? Yeah, so I, th I thought that was very interesting. I was I'm personally very fascinated with this innovation going around and I thought that the way that it's maintained this impact was quite an elegant solution to this uh, collateral ratio that is retained by the market. Um, let's talk a little bit about algorithmic stable coins, right? So I'm sure when you work on Frax, uh, there are competitors out there, I guess. The earliest one being Basis, uh, the original project did not launch, but uh, two years ago, um, but, but it's compared, some anonymous guys launched Basis Cash and uh, sometime uh, late last year, September, if I remember correctly, uh, empty set dollar launch. So, and then before that, I think earlier 2019, there was um, uh, Amplifop launching uh, early 2020, I think, or, I think so, Amplifop. So where the supply increases and decreases, single token on Amplifop. So, so we've seen th these algorithmic stable coins, like it's, it aims to achieve a $1 stable coin pack, but like in reality, it becomes sort of a money game played by whales where uh, the price fluctuates wildly between anywhere between twenty-five cents to two dollars, three dollars, or so on. I'm just curious to hear from your point of view, right? Um, what do you see as a problem with these sort of stable coins, the ample fork sort of stable coins, and uh, with, and the, the the algorithmic kind like basis and ESD? Yeah. So first of all, um, I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of algorithmic stable coins. Just just the general concept. I like to say. You know, um, the important thing about them is they're uh, trustless mediums of exchange. So actually, one thing I'd, I'd really like uh, the DeFi space to maybe uh, stop calling them necessarily, uh, you know, stable coins because Tether and USDC have, and, and the fiat coins have kind of co-opted that name, right? And there's going to be a lot of uh, regulation around stable coins, some good, some, you know, difficult to adhere to. But I, I like the fact that, the real value proposition of, of algorithmic stable coins, right, are, are that they're trustless mediums of exchange. Um, and now there's a bunch of types. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of studying uh, each of the, the different mechanisms. I think, um, I think just 
overall, one thing that is important to think about with Frax compared to the other ones is that um, what we've shown, at least so far, um, is that if you combine uh, a fractional algorithmic model, the actual amount of stability in the algorithmic portion of the market cap actually becomes uh, much more stable, which is actually one of those situations where uh, you know, the, the whole thing is more valuable than its individual pieces added together. For example, right now, there's a, a little bit over 100 million fracs in circulation uh, at a 84% collateral ratio. That means that there's around 16 million fracs that uh, is not backed, right? It's algorithmically uh, stabilized. Frax is almost exactly a dollar right now as, as we're, we're talking. If you ran this idea in your head of what if there was a, a, a basis uh, structure or, or like an ample fourth, uh, you know, st structure uh, fork or something, and that had a $16 million market cap, which is quite small, right? But it was 16 million in market cap. Do you think it would be this stable? Do you think that would be as stable around a dollar as, as Frax is? I, we have, now we have data and, and the real market is no, absolutely not, right? Not even close, right? And so the fact that now there is actually like a algorithmic supply of a stable coin, 16 million, which is small, but it's sizable now. You can't just say, oh, this is just, you know, wrapped USDC because it's not. There's 16 million of unbacked fracks. Um, and that's as stable as the, as the collateralized portion. I think that's really important to talk about, and, and the, that that's uh, that's something that's uh, you know we've we've discovered, and you know we've so far we've shown is is quite interesting and and promising. So um, the other designs kind of lack that, right? And and so one of the first things uh, we're starting to see, for example, is ESDV2 uh, has this uh, partial. I think they call it uh, partial reserve model, um, and it's uh it takes a lot of you know inspiration and interesting ideas and stuff from frax and, and other collateralized coins dot maker and stuff like that right and uh it tries to test you know different uh ratios i think it's as far as i understand it's it's set by their governance which isn't very reflexive in my opinion but um they'll probably make it uh you know probably more reflexive as as they continue to to do that um basis uh i'm actually a big fan i actually farmed it in, in early days i was uh, pretty active uh in the early community i still check in i i like actually the the basis cash design um one of the things about it um is that i think that just with no collateral at all it's uh it's difficult to regain the peg when it's it's at a certain price like it's like at 80 cents right and then the discount on the bonds, which how the, it's calculated is the price of the stable coin squared, right? If, if in that situation, it doesn't make sense to buy uh, the, the bonds, you get this situation where the price gets stuck at under a dollar, right? Because like, let's say you have the price at 80, right? And, and like, and the bond discount is like, you know, it's like 60 cents or whatever. If, if no one buys, if, if at this time bonds at, at like 64 cents is, uh, is, is not a good deal, no one will buy it, right? And then like the price will just, it'll just be flat at like 80 or under the peg. And, the, and I think that that's one of the main issues is that uh, that's just happening, right? These, these, these coins are getting like stuck at, at 80 or they're getting stuck at like 77 or they're getting stuck at 92, right? And there's no reflexive component but what's what's interesting is i think they're also i, I follow a lot of these uh stable coins and i think they're also having governance uh proposals and stuff for having like part of their expansion go to like a treasury or, or something like that or or some kind of collateral which you know i i like to think you know we inspired that or, or something like that and uh because because we showed that it's kind of you know, it, it actually creates more value than the actual collateral value, right? There's, there's like more stable value in FRAX right now than the actual collateral value, right? There's only 84 uh, million USDC, but there's like 100 uh, million FRAX and, and they're all, it's all at a dollar. Um, so I think that's the main thing is, is that some kind of um, 
system where there's outside exogenous value that actually is able to be part of the monetary policy of, of these uh, protocols. It's interesting, interesting how you, how you brought this up. Um, um, so um, so I, I've been monitoring this collateral ratio, right, um, for the past few weeks since I started learning about Frax and I uh, started out, I think when I first started noticing it was probably 94 or 90, maybe around 95% or so collateral ratio. And then over the past couple of weeks, it's gone down to around 84%, as you mentioned. Um, I don't have a mental model of how it, what would be the stable state collateral ratio. I, I keep asking myself every day, what would be an equilibrium collateral ratio? And my gut just views that I think the market can support around 40 or 50% collateral ratio, but I don't know. And would like to hear from you. Like, do you have any idea on what do you think is a stable state collateral ratio? What do you think the market can absorb? I mean, you, we saw Tether, you mentioned that it can easily absorb 25%, right? So, but what do you think? Can the market absorb a, a 20% collateral ratio for Frax, for example? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh... I get asked that a lot and other people in the community always talk about the collateral ratio, but the reason we designed it exactly like this is when we uh, were originally thinking about it, we're like, oh, geez, like, we don't want to like have any kind of real say. We want the market to decide. What's funny is then we came up with this interesting system, but then people will still ask us, right? They're like, hey, when do you think? But uh, the whole point is I, I honestly have no idea, right? And, and I try to actually temper a lot of expectations because um, at first, people told us, hey, this is uh, really cool, but we're just worried the collateral ratio would just get stuck at 100%. Like it would just, it would always just get arbed and, and perfectly arbed and, and stuff like that. And it would just get stuck like at 99, 100, 98, 100 or something. Uh, that's clearly not happening, right? Um, then, uh, then people said, oh, well, maybe it'll never go, you know, below, uh, you know, 90 or, or 85 and stuff. And now we're, we're under 85. Um, I have no idea how long we'll stay at like 80 something, right? Uh, maybe next week we'll, we'll be at, you know, 70 something. Maybe it'll re-collateralize back up to uh, close to 90. Um, I, I actually don't know. That's part of kind of what, uh, you know, the, the whole thing at the beginning, I was like, I have no idea how this system will uh, react. And so one of the things that I, I like to make sure the community and everyone knows is like, we could be at uh, 80 something percent for like a month. We could be at it for like two months, right? And if, if we're supposed to just let this deterministic system, you know, work as it's intended. Um, and then in, in like another two weeks, we could go from 80 to like 65. The whole point is as long as the, the stable coin actually stays around the peg and there's slight demand increase, right? It's like a slight uh, higher amount that the minting is, is continuing to go up and stuff. It'll, it'll continue to decollateralize. It'll continue to uh, go more and more algorithmic, but uh, how quick or if it'll, you know, if it'll find some steady state for a while and then it'll go down and find some steady state. Uh, I think that's actually how it's going to be because uh, that's how it's like looking like right now. Um, but I don't know. Um, I have no idea. Now, one thing I will say is like, we're, we're thinking of updating the collateral ratio PID controller design to something that's slightly more uh, uh, encompassing of like the realities of, of the system. And, and by that, I mean, right now, it just takes a look at the Oracle price, literally just the FRAX Oracle price above a dollar, right? And it's only gone one or two cents above a dollar, as you said. Um, the other thing we want to look at is like, what about looking at the market cap of the FXS token or the liquidity of it on chain? Because you can do that on chain entirely, you know, trustlessly. And that's important, right? Because Frax uh, being at a dollar and one cents when it has 500 million market cap, um, which we're seeming like we're on our way to hopefully, right? Um, versus it only having a $5 million market cap is totally different, right? Those are totally different, uh, you know, supplies that require much more uh, robust algorithmic stabilization in the FXS liquidity and market cap, right? To stabilize. So one of the main things we're thinking of doing is updating it a little bit so it's not completely... Um, only, uh, you know, um, price based, um, because the price doesn't necessarily 
get the data of market cap or liquidity, right? Um, we'll propose some obvious like uh, governance stuff. We have a snapshot page open. Uh, people are putting proposals up there. We'll, we'll be talking about it in the community. There's actually a, a lot of people um, uh, we're talking about it. Actually, I, I wrote on the whiteboard here. Uh, I don't think you can really see it, but we're listing all of the different uh, things that you could design the PID controller around. Like you could take in the FRAX market cap, the FXS market cap. Um, we could actually take in, uh, you know, time slash memory of how long it's above a dollar, right? Like if it, if it's a dollar for like, uh, if it's over a dollar for 10 minutes, it's different than if it's a dollar, uh, over a dollar for the whole, uh, one hour window or something, right? We're actually talking about that, uh, earlier today. So there's a, there's a lot of improvements, uh, incremental improvements, just like any, uh, good protocol that we're, we're working on, but. Overall, um, just the past three weeks, things have looked quite, quite good. An interesting idea is that I'm processing all this new information that I'm hearing from you and trying to make sense of things. Um, I, think, I think early in your module sentences, you, you mentioned that uh, about the demand for FRAX, right? I mean, FXS, uh, the collateral ratio will go up, I mean, go down incrementally as, uh, as, a, as a function of the FRAX demand because there's more demand, the price will most likely stay around $1 or $1 and then drive down this collateral ratio. What is driving the demand for FRAX at this point in time? And it's a stable coin, right? I mean, you could own Tether, USDC, DAI, SUSD, any other sort of stable coin. Why FRAX? And, and I guess the first question, and the second question is, what can you do with FRAX? So what do you plan? How do you plan to increase adoption of FRAX in the ecosystem of Ethereum? Yeah, and that's like the most important thing, right? Because at the end of the day, if this is supposed to be a uh, trustless medium of exchange or, or money, it's got to be accepted in, in places for, for lending, for trading, for, uh, you know, purchases and, and things like that, which I think actually comes, purchases comes towards the end. But um, we actually uh, have been integrated in quite a number of places uh, just in the three weeks that we've been up. Um, we recently passed a uh, CREAM uh, governance vote. We're going to be on there for lending and borrowing. Um, Andre today, if you guys saw, released the permissionless uh, curve pools, which is really cool. And the inaugural uh, pool that, that he launched uh, were the algo pools starting with FRAX. And then the other ones are uh, Basis and, and MythCash. So that's really exciting. So now we have uh, curve uh, pools for FRAX. Um, we're getting uh, on the Sushi Onsen menu, um, which is like their uh, exclusive um, you know, for sushi rewards and, and extra liquidity, um, you'll soon be able to add liquidity and earn FXS as well as sushi. So that's, uh, pretty good. And we're, the goal is to basically, uh, two things. One is the whole point of algorithmic stable coins over existing, uh, ones is for it to be a trustless medium of exchange with no custodial risk of, you know, the dollars or, or, uh, you know, having, um, blacklists and, and things like that. The other thing is you have to actually have enough stability where people actually uh, will hold tracks instead of Tether or, or USDC, right? And I think the conversation in the algo space is now getting to the point where it's like, okay, uh, how long do those other uh, you know, projects and stuff uh, take to figure out to be as really tight around the peg uh, for people to actually think about holding them or how, or, or are they just games, right? Are they just uh, stabilization games, which are fun, but they're not um, in the same space as, as uh, other stable points. We think Frax actually has already in the few weeks that it's been out, um, proven that it, it can likely stay uh, close enough to the peg that it's actually useful. It can stay at a dollar, 99 cents, dollar one if it's expanding. Um, and it could actually be useful. So the goal here is to get it accepted in every place that USDC and, and Tether is, uh, have it be as stable as them virtually, and then remove the custodial risk and, and, and other things so that if people really highly prefer, uh, you know, using um, a fully autonomous decentralized solution, they can do that. And so what that actually allows us to do is, uh, for example, implement uh, 
privacy tech and, and things like that. Uh, in Frax, one of the things we're looking at is, for example, um, what if we incentivize something similar to a tornado cash style uh, mixer, right? Um, what's actually interesting is since minting and redeeming Frax is kind of like a, a pool, right? You put in collateral and you get out Frax, right? Or you put in Frax and you get out collateral and FXS, right? Um, it actually is already uh, kind of in the structure. We would just have to change uh, how the transactions work to include some ZK proofs and, and things like that. And you can have the advantages of, of a fully anonymous uh, stable asset, which would be really cool. Um, so we are able to do that. Obviously, I don't think USDC and, and Tether and stuff are going to uh, allow that. In fact, there's probably a um, there's probably an argument or, or thing to be thought about that as more uh, stablecoin regulation comes out, if uh, USDC and, and Tether will be required to, for example, uh, blacklist major privacy uh, smart contracts, such as like Tornado Cash or, or the other solutions that are, that are coming out. I don't know, but um, I would say that it's possible. It's almost, I would say it's about 50-50. And all of those things create just a unique value proposition for something like Frax, like an algorithmic stablecoin that's truly, you know, decentralized and, um, you know, uh, completely permissionless. So let's, let's talk about this, this risk of uh, USDC or USDT uh, blacklisting certain addresses, right? Because you say they could blacklist the Tornado Cash uh, contract. Um, let's run through a scenario. So there was a hack in one of the centralized exchanges where let's say a million USDC was stolen, for example, and this million USDC is deposited into Frax, and then, and then Frax is minted, and then two days later, USDC decides to, for example, blacklist. I don't know how do you do, but like blacklist this USDC now. Frax will be impacted with it because it's supposedly eighty six percent collateralized, but it could go down to immediately. 50% because of this blacklisting of USDC. Or I don't know how it works because it's sort of held in a pool. So it becomes quite a big risk as well. If USDC decides single-handedly to blacklist the entire address, then everything's kind of in trouble, right? So I'm sure you guys have thought about this. So I want to hear your thoughts about how this, what do you guys think of this risk? Yeah, so definitely. Um, first of all, we decided to launch with a, a stable coin, so like USDC as, as the collateral to start. So people can really understand and wrap their head around uh, the, the whole fractional algorithmic mechanism. In theory, you can, you can actually um, build this exact same mechanism with a volatile crypto like ETH and BTC. Obviously like the, the collateral ratio would, would change as, as volatile as the value of the volatility volatile crypto goes up and down. Um, and there's actual ways to make it uh, a little bit better. But we want to think about that for like Frax V2. Um, but as long as V1 is, is still out, basically, you're totally right, right? There's the, the collateral has custodial risk while like the, the actual stablecoin is, is algorithmic and permissionless. So uh, basically, we've just put it one level down that we've put the custodial, custodial risk one uh, step removed. Um, I think obviously as Frax gets more and more algorithmic, the, the risk of it actually uh, goes down, right? It becomes much less uh, a part of the, the risk of the whole system and becomes less systemic. But it is, it is currently a risk. Three weeks in, it's, it's possible. I, I think that we really do recognize that. And so for, for V2, uh, people can basically uh, be confident that there's uh, there's going to be other collateral types. There's definitely going to be uh, like I'll actually give uh, some some stuff to to think about. Like one of the things that's interesting that we're exploring, um, not finalized. We don't really know if this is what we'll uh, release or anything. But we were thinking of having uh, Frax be backed by uh, one dollar of LP token value. So that's that's something that's quite, kind of interesting. That's in the same. Uh, thought of uh, as uh, as Phi Phi protocol. If you guys have uh, heard, the, they're they're kind of uh, have this similar fractional stuff with a different type of mechanism. Um, so, for example, if you have a, a Frax ETH LP token, um, and and we say that you can mint uh, one dollar of uh, Frax, you mint one Frax for one dollar value of 
uh, the Frax ETH LP token, that's actually interesting, right? Because it's backed by $1 of liquidity. So, and, and then that liquidity is backstop with ETH, um, but then the liquidity token is not as volatile as ETH, right? It's, it's actually um, softened volatility because it's against the, the stable coin itself, right? So that kind of stuff is very interesting. It's, I think that's where uh, stable coin design is, is, uh, is headed. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, other stable coins started looking at that. In fact, it's kind of similar to stable credit, right? If you, if you think of Andre's uh, stable credit, um, Andre's a brilliant, uh, brilliant guy, probably one of, if not the biggest galaxy brain in DeFi, right? And uh, I think he's really onto something in terms of the stable credit design. Um, now, it's not a algorithmic token, right? He, he's basically um, building this on AMM uh, curves that are essentially, it's actually almost like a better uh, maker instead of it being over collateralized uh, with, you know, pooled assets, it's over collateralized with LP tokens. So that's a big improvement. That's, that's actually really cool. Um, with Frax, one of the things we're thinking of is what if it's just fractionally collateralized with LP tokens? So that's where I think uh, a lot of the um, algorithmic research is, is headed and we want to still be at the top of that. And, and so that's one of our answers to um, how we remove the custodial risk and the, and the centralization risk of, of USDC. Do you see uh, in the next version of FRAC, do you think the volatile assets will it be like Bitcoin, WBTC, ETH, or would it most likely be the LP tokens coming in first? Most likely the LP tokens first, I suppose, right? Um, I think it'll be a really collaborative process uh, with the community because first of all, we, we don't want to, we don't want to put out any of these things with just, uh, you know, ourselves because there's a bunch of really smart people in the, in the FRAX community uh, that we actually really, really respect and, and they've come up with really good uh, ideas. So one of the things we might do actually is that we might actually release different collateral pools, but with very small uh, ceilings, right? And so, so basically right now with USDC, there's just one. So there, there can't really be a, a ceiling, right? But for example, we can release a uh, Bitcoin or ETH collateral uh, option, but only a maximum of, you know, 3 million fracs can be backed by that, right? Um, and so that's small enough where it can easily be algorithmically stabilized if, you know, something happens and those that collateral dumps, you know, 40% or something like that. Um, but uh, it's, it's, in, it's big enough where you could see the demand for it, how it actually functions in the wild. Um, so we might actually launch a, a, a few and, and very small and, and just let it actually build up with the community and see what people think and, and increase the, the ceiling through governance and, and things like that. So I think definitely expect um, a lot of like good and different collateral types coming up. So it's sort of like in the future in V2, it will be like FRAX, currently every FRAX is back with USDC, but it could be a future where there will be several pools in FRAX where a big portion is backed by USDC, a smaller portion backed by BTC, ETH, and some LP tokens. Would it be sort of right to say it would, it would look something like that? Yeah, and, and, so, and so we could see how those, and, and they would be small enough where it, there would not be a systemic risk, right? Because we don't you know, want to actually just throw it in there and then see the, this whole system that's probably going to be really big by then, uh, potentially you know, implode or lose, lose uh, the peg. But it would be big enough for us to actually be able to see what the demand is and, and how they perform. So yeah, I, I think a, a future where there's different pooled uh, collateral other than just uh, USDC. Again, we launched it with USDC so that it would be super simple. So people can like wrap their head around this fractional algorithmic idea that no one's built. And so people can really understand it, uh, see if they like it, be a part of the community. Uh, it's easier to communicate with people. And then um, the other stuff you could do, for example, is uh, some people in the community have suggested uh, interest bearing collateral, right? So, so there's, uh, there's no reason why uh, you can't back it with $1 worth of interest bearing collateral. And as that accrues interest, uh, so like, for example, why earn tokens, right? Like why die or something. And uh, as that accrues interest, the interest goes back to FXS holders, 
right? And so that's actually very elegant. We don't even have to, uh, you know, decide to, we don't even have to create our own strategies or, or frax bolts or anything. We actually just uh, outsource that to the really smart guys at, at uh, Wire and like Bantig and, and all of them. And then uh, we do get the interest for it, right? And then that goes back to uh, FXS holders, which is great. I, I see a future where like, um, if you guys play your cards right, like, I mean, you guys can pretty much take over as the de facto uh, decentralized stablecoin. I mean, it was supposed to be played by DAI, but there's some controversy. I mean, that's, they didn't really play, it, it, this is made hard, like a lot of DeFi projects on DAI, but like, I mean, there's some difficulty growing DAI up to a certain point. Um, but, but in terms of like, like when you introduce BTC and if you see it kind of like, Pretty much resembling okay, we if we if we are like fractional, I mean for for maker it would be like 150% back by like for, for most stable coins, like but for you guys would it be the same? Like because the collateral rate collateral value of the underlying assets is very volatile, right? Yeah, so so that's why um so that's why we we haven't really decided exactly how to launch those kinds of things, especially because we want to have a very coherent uh, vision for them. So for example, one of the things we've said is if we do launch, you know, volatile, just raw volatile collateral like ETH or WBTC or something, um, we would likely launch a, a bond token with it so that the mm -hmm. whole protocol becomes a, a three token uh, design, a debt uh, token. So the bond, you know, the shares, which is what accrues all of the excess remaining value once uh, bonds are repaid. And then, you know, the stable point um, that would actually help uh, recover the, you know, any collateral value that's unexpectedly lost, right? The bond token would help uh, cushion that. So one of the things we're thinking of is if we do launch volatile collateral, would it require uh, to make the design work well? Would it require a, a debt token, a bond token of sorts? Yeah. Um, one of the things about that is uh, I don't think the current bond designs like ESD coupons and uh, the current basis bonds uh, work as well as probably originally intended. Um, as evidenced by ESD V2 is uh, moving to a different bond design um, or coupons as they call it. Um, and then I think the basis guys are improving their bonds. I've seen some, you know, uh, basis improvement proposals that have uh, said to slightly tweak the, the bond design. I don't think there's a, there's a bond design that, you know, has proven to work. It just, you know, plainly said, right? Like it, none of these things have proven to work at a, uh, at scale and at a, at a, you know, useful, um, you know, amounts. So until we feel confident that like, uh, there's a good bond design, we won't really release a mm -hmm. uh, frax bond, but we're thinking about it. So, so that's, that's one thing in order to launch volatile collateral, we probably need uh, a bond, which is emitted when there's not enough collateral, right? Like, like when uh, the collateral ratio is not being able to be held um, to retract the supply of, of frax in the open market so that it uh, moves in lockstep with whatever collateral ratio you need. Um, it's a lot of mechanism design, uh, a lot of things to, to really stimulate and explore. Yeah, I was reading your documentation and one of the things that was sort of saying coming soon is the Frex bonds thing. So I thought like I would, I would like to ask you more on Frex bonds, but it seems like a lot of things are still being de in development. So there's no finalized design yet. Um, I mean, I'm just going to ask you, like, do you think like you will come out sometime this year? I mean, mid this year or something like that? Or I mean, oh, oh, and, and also like how do you see the design being different from ESD coupons and basis bonds? Do you see these frax bonds uh, having an expiration date or not having an expiration date? It goes on to perpetuity. That's the main difference between ESD coupons and basis bonds, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so first of all, um, we don't really like to uh, release the exact same thing uh, as, as any other protocol because A, um, we think that Frax is so unique that if we release something, it's, it's got to be in the image of, of what's, you know, uh, symbiotic to it in, in the protocol. Um, so our bonds would probably be uh, anchored to the actual collateral ratio. So for example, if, uh, if we had a bond, I think what we would probably do as a starting point is it would only be emitted if um, 
the collateral value is, is uh, dropping compared to the actual target collateral ratio. So let's say um, there's 90 million collateral in the system because it's a 90% collateral ratio and, and 100 million fracs in circulation. If the value of the collateral uh, drops to 80 million, right now there's a 10 million uh, dollar gap of, of collateral that, that's, uh, that's empty that's when we would actually uh, emit our bond. I think that's the correct uh, way to do it. And, and the discount rate, whatever it ends, it ends up being, would be dependent on this remaining, um, you know, this gap, right? This gap of uh, value that the system actually needs to, to recover either by retracting the supply of fracks um, or by, uh, having the collateral eventually, you know, appreciate in value in, into that, right? Um, so uh, that's, that's the bond design we're thinking of. Uh, we don't like expiry bonds because it just hasn't uh, seemed like that has been a success as evidenced by the fact that ESD itself is moving off of them in, in V2. Um, we, we like the auto converting bonds, ones that actually just convert to the stable coin at maturity. Um, the main issue with those bonds is fungibility, right? Because if you, for example, have um, a one month bond, right? And it automatically converts after a, uh, a month, regardless of, of like whether the, the protocol is expanding or not, right? Um, the issue is uh, you have to continue to issue bonds that ex uh, mature on the same exact date. Because if you, you know, the next week you issue bonds that mature at a new date, now you have two non-fungible bonds with each other. You have the bonds that mature on the first date, and then you have the bonds that mature on the second date, and then you can't have high liquidity for those. You can't have uh, one Uniswap pool that's trading bonds against you know, the, the stable coin. Uh, you can't ever have exchanges uh, list your, your bond tokens because they're not the same tokens. They're always uh, maturing at different dates. So like you, they can't actually list them under the, the same ticker. And so you have a huge, huge liquidity issue because they're not fungible, right? And so that's one of the main challenges that, that we're researching is if we do release a bond, it's got to be highly fungible, highly liquid, um, extremely unique and specialized to, you know, Frax's fractional algorithmic design and um, allow keeping of the, the whole system at the collateral ratio that's currently being targeted uh, very robustly. So those are the three main, uh, the three main characteristics that we're, we're looking for. I started to see how, uh, what you mean now with the need to launch Frax bonds before you can support volatile assets because of how the underlying collateral value changes with uh, and, and how the bonds can help stabilize this thing. I mean, now it's simple. You guys are only backing with USDC and USDC has shown historically that it's been quite stable to a dollar. But I mean, it could be a, a case of, I mean, I don't think it will happen, but if USDC goes down and then the value goes down to 70 cents, then like you have an issue and if you don't have a frex bond, then, then, then that may that may be a bit troubling. But yeah, I, I see the point of where when does the Frex bonds come in. It's very interesting, the points and how you mentioned that it should be a tradable token. If you look at coupons and basis bonds, those are not tradable and, and, and they are technically non-fungible because every one of them has a different epoch and has a different epoch, you know. So yeah, so so actually that's true of ESD. The current basis bonds uh, are, I believe, um, are fungible. The original basis white paper with the first in first out queue of bonds i think that was uh not very well thought out because those wouldn't be fungible right because they, they have a order that that they're redeemed but um the current basis cash bonds i think since they all get paid like pro rata if they put them in the treasury uh i think that they are uh fully fungible which is good the problem with those bonds that the reason we don't want to use that uh type of structure is those don't really seem like debt. Those just seem like a call option on the next uh, expansion, right? They just seem like uh, you take out like a call option at like a discount curve, right? The, the price of stable coin squared uh, on the next expansion. And I think that's what their problem is, is that uh, that's why sometimes basis cash seems to get stuck under the curve, right under the peg, because sometimes it's not actually profitable or, or a good deal to buy call options on the next expansion 
at the current price that the, the bond pricing curve is offering you. So people just don't buy it, right? And so, and then you have a problem, right? Because you need to retract because you're at 80 cents. Not enough people are buying it because they think it's the bad deal. And then it's, it's, like, a, it's like a ball rolling down a, a curve and then it like slowly just like stops here because there's uh, that, that's exactly where um, there's no force, right? There's no retraction or expansion, it just is stuck, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's the issue with those. And so we obviously don't wanna release something like, uh, like that unless we think that there is uh, a better mechanism than that. Yeah, it's a very good analogy of how you explained the, the issue with this is one. I've been observing this uh, for the past couple of weeks as well. I mean, it seems to be quite stuck. I mean, all these like algorithmic standpoint, ESD, BSD, BSD, uh, basis cash, they all kind of like stuck below a dollar at this point in time. Uh, different issues with each of them, but like <laughs> interesting points. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think sort of I've asked sort of most of my questions uh, on tracks. I think it's been an interesting hour before I end this podcast. But maybe is there anything that I should have asked that I have not already asked or anything that you want to say about tracks? Um, no, I mean, this is actually really fun. Uh, the, the only thing I guess I I'd say is uh, we're, we're really focused on continuing to lead uh, stablecoin, especially algorithmic stablecoin research and features. Um, this is like a passion project of mine. I kind of see, um, you know, all of us, me, Jason in the back there, uh, Travis and, and the team and, and stuff as this is pretty much our passion the same way, for example, uh, low level L1 tech is uh, Vitalik's passion and, and a lot of the, uh, hardcore ETH guys. So we're super uh, interested in collaborating. Um, actually, I, I love the uh, other Algo stablecoin projects and communities. It might sound like I was a little tough on them, but it's, it's actually just to actually give constructive criticism. I actually uh, love to help out in, in the basis cash community. Uh, the ESD community has some of the smartest people, um, you know, Andrew, uh, um, Mike, Lewis, uh, Scott, Will Price, all of those guys, they're really, really smart guys. Um, so I, I really think that this is kind of the next big area in, in DeFi and, and stuff that uh, I've been talking about uh, before it was this, this hot, right? Frax was started in 2019. So we're just super excited to be working on, on this area. Um, so if, if that's something anyone that's listening really likes to do, hit us up, um, we're really available. We literally just work on this stuff uh, not nonstop. Um, I'm available on Twitter, uh, Telegram, um, and, and super uh, active in the, in the FRAX Telegram group and community, so. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to you and learning about uh, FRAX. I thought I knew a lot about FRAX, but talking to you, just like I just learned so much more about FRAX today. So yeah, thanks, thanks. a lot. Thanks a lot for taking the time to come on the CoinGecko podcast. Of course. Take care, man. All right. Take care.